Let's see if Gemini Pro is any good at chemistry. So here we have Google Bart running on Gemini Pro. Provide the structure of halicin in smiles format. Here is the response. Certainly, here is the smiles format for halicin. So here's the smile structure. And then it gave me a link to Wikipedia. I pasted this uh, halicin string into this checker. And that's the structure I got. And here's the Wikipedia article on halicin. So let's compare these two structures. So here we have... Uh, the output from the smiles format. So there is this nitrogen group, then it goes into this ring with nitrogen, sulfur, sulfur bridge, sulfur to nitrogen. All right, so that is correct. So that was very encouraging because I tried the same test with uh, GPT-4 both in uh, Bing Chat and uh, with the GPT-4 application. And I did that about seven months ago. If you can check out the video, I'll put it on the screen. And in that case, it did not give me the right answer. So, uh, so far, Bart is already winning over GPT-4. But let's uh, try to ask some uh, few simple questions that like a chemistry student would be able to answer. How many sulfur atoms are in halicin? So I have the structure right here that it gave me. So there are three sulfur atoms, one, two, and three. There are three sulfur atoms in halicin, okay? Show the code behind this result. All right, that's really cool. All right, so define smile string in halicin. Okay, so that's right here, that's great. Count the number of S characters, okay? So there is a code for that, that's really nice and then print the number. Okay, so that's that's really cool. I like that a lot, but that's pretty simple for computers. So let's try something a little bit more complex. So let's ask, which of those three sulfur atoms would be the most reactive? I think it would be the middle one here because that's uh, just uh, easy to attack. So this answer looks pretty elaborate. So here I have sulfur one, S1. Uh, it's not super clear which one is S1, S2, and S3, but let's read it. Uh, sulfur one, connected to a carbon atom in a double bond and an sp2 hybridized nitrogen. So all of these sulfurs are just connected to carbon. So this one is connected to carbon here, carbon here. This one is carbon here, carbon here, carbon and carbon here. So um, that's slightly incorrect as far as uh, saying that it's connected to nitrogen. Sulfur two, part of aromatic ring with conjugated double bond. So that's probably this one or this one. I imagine one, both of these are aromatic rings. Aromatic rings are generally have reduced reactivity due to delocalization of electrons. So that's true. However, the lone pair of adjacent nitrogen could activate the ring for electrophilic attack, potentially increasing S2 reactivity compared to N, uh, S1. So I think this is S1, this is S2. And then let's read S3, bonded to two sp3 hybridized carbons and a positively charged nitrogen. So I'm pretty sure it's talking about this one and it's saying that it's connected to this uh, positively charged nitrogen, but that those are not connected. This configuration makes S3 more electron rich and susceptible to nucleophilic attack compared to the other two sulfurs, okay? Additionally, the positive charge of the nitrogen can further activate the adjacent sulfur. Let's ask for clarification. Can you tell me which one is S1, S2, and S3? Here it says S1, located directly connected the carbon atom in the double bond and the sp2 hybridized nitrogen on the left side of the molecule. So S3 is clearly the middle one, and then S2, part of the aromatic ring on the right side of the molecule, adjacent to the lone pair of the nitrogen atom. Let's get a little bit of a clarification. Which one is the right side, and which one is the left side of the molecule? Is NH2 on the right side or the left side? So I'm trying to orient the molecule in, in mind of Gemini Pro. So here's the NH2 group. Let's see what it says. You're right. I apologize for the ambiguity in my previous explanation. My early description might have been unclear regarding the left or right sides of the halicin molecule. So to rectify this, let's consider the molecule in a specific orientation. Imagine looking up at the halicin molecule as it's lying flat on the table. So that would be right here with the NH2 group pointing upwards. Okay, so let's assume it's pointing upwards, uh, which is possible. With this orientation, the double bond with S1 lies on the left side of the molecule. So I would say it's probably this one. Consequently, the aromatic ring with the S2 is on the right side. So it's probably this one, but maybe they're flipped. S3 is clearly in the middle. So let's try to be even more specific. Which sulfur atom is closer to the NH2 group? Imagine the halicin molecule in 2D representation. So maybe that'll help. Okay, I think we're in the hallucination land. In a 2D representation of halicin with the NH2 group pointing upwards, the sulfur atom closest to it would be sulfur 3. But then it's really convincing. Here's a visualization to illustrate. So it's like, oh, that's cool. It gives me even a picture. So when you click on this, I clicked on that. 
and it gives you some fancy looking structure. So this is uh, some representation of atoms, but it's completely unrelated to halicin. So you can see here are some rings with uh, six molecules. There's nothing like that in halicin. And it talks about uh, halogen bonds. There are no halogen bonds. So halogens are chlorine, fluorine, bromine, things like that. There's nothing like that in halicin. And the paper where this figure came from has nothing to do with halicin. So and it keeps going, as you can see, and it talks about more about the groups and which one is where. How can the NH2 group point upwards in a 2D representation? So it gave me a pretty generic answer about 2D and 3D representations. So I think that's here's where we can see the large language model uh, basis of these models. Uh, you ask some question, and then it goes to like a general knowledge. It, it kind of drops what you're talking about, and it kind of defaults to general Wikipedia knowledge. You're right, the inherent limitation of 2D representation to accurately depict 3D spatial arrangement, and then it goes like into uh, standard differences between 2D and 3D representation, and how you could represent like um, the group pointing upwards that you could use dashed lines. But it kind of dropped the conversation that I had with it about Hallison. Uh, real human would not do this. So we still have a ways to go on this one. So let's bring the conversation back to Hallison. The reference you provided earlier talks about halogens. So I'm talking about this one right here. How many halogens are in halicin? And I uh, on purpose ask halogens and not particularly like fluorine or bromine, because then you could just look through the uh, smile string and look for those uh, uh, atoms. But I wanted to see if it has more of a uh, holistic understanding of halogens, which ones are halogens. So let's see what happens. The answer is super encouraging. You're absolutely right. My early mistake was a slip up. I apologize for any confusion it may have caused. Halicin does not actually contain any halogen atoms. The reference I provided for the SMILES format was meant for a different molecule and was mistakenly associated with your inquiry about halicin. Um, so I wonder how you could prevent this in the future. Halicin solely contains uh, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur atoms. That is correct. There are all no halogens present in its structure. That's really encouraging. I strive to provide accurate information. I appreciate you pointing out my error. Please let me know if you have any questions about halicin and any other chemical compound. I am here to help. Are both S1 and S2 in aromatic rings? Yes, both S1 and S2 are indeed in part of aromatic rings. Here's a breakdown of visualization for better understanding. S1, this sulfur atom is directly connected to a carbon atom involved in a double bond. So that would be both of these, okay. The other carbon it bonds to participates in the aromatic ring on the left side of the molecule. As you can see, S1 forms a five-member ring with alternating single and double bonds. Okay, that's what aromatic rings are. Fulfilling the criteria for aromaticity. Okay, so that's true. S2, this sulfur atom is directly incorporated into the six-membered aromatic ring on the right side of the molecule. Okay, there is no sixth member aromatic ring one two three four five okay so none of these are six so um that's not correct i do not see a six membered aromatic ring can you double check if that is correct you're absolutely right i made another mistake in my previous explanation you seem to make a lot of mistakes bard i apologize for the confusion s2 is actually not a part of six membered aromatic ring in halicin my early image was inaccurate and i misrepresented the structure S2 is indeed directly bonded to a nitrogen atom, another carbon in the molecule, but these connections do not form aromatic ring. The carbon involved is not part of the alternating single and double bond pattern required for aromaticity. So none of the sulfurs are directly connected to nitrogens. So that's a carbon, that's a carbon, that's a carbon, and that's a carbon. All the sulfurs are connected to the carbons, if I understand this chemistry correctly. Therefore, only S1 participates in a five-membered aromatic ring. Based on my understanding, none of the sulfur atoms are directly bonded to nitrogen atoms. Can you confirm or refute this statement? I'm saying that none of the sulfurs are touching nitrogens. All right, you're absolutely correct. I'm deeply sorry for the repeated inaccuracies in my previous responses. It's very apologetic. None of the sulfur atoms in halicin are directly bonded to nitrogen atoms. My earlier statements about S2 being bonded to nitrogen were completely wrong. Oof. I truly appreciate pointing these errors. It helps me identify and learn from my mistakes. I'm hope I'm wondering if I'm uh, training Bart for Google right now. There have been proven my accuracy and reliability. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Please don't hesitate to ask any further questions you may have about Halicin and any other scientific topic. 
I'm here to learn and provide you with most accurate information possible. So in summary, I would say BART with uh, Gemini Pro is not a magic bullet. It seems to be a lot more convincing than GPT-4. Uh, when I used GPT-4 to uh, find the uh, smiles of, uh, for Halicin, it wasn't giving me the right answer at all. And it was even worse than this. So here I got the correct structure. And then the initial answers were extremely convincing. I think if you know very little about chemistry, you might be um, believing those answers. And also, I really like this Python code it gave me. So I definitely think this is a step forward. I would say um, Gemini Pro is better at chemistry than uh, GPT-4. Maybe just the interface is better, and therefore it gives me better uh, uh, answers. But it's still hallucinates all over the place. And I would say it's not usable for any real work. It's good for entertainment, but for real work, it's not usable at this moment. Uh, so I, if you're interested in more information, I made a video about this one, GPT sucks at um, chemistry. You can watch that one to see how GPT-4 did. But I think what the future is, is um, uh, we need uh, the large language models. We need to uh, fuse them with something else, like tools that they can look up and reference. Um, and that is what the ChemCrow uh, video is about, the ChemCrow paper. They use the large language model essentially as an agent uh, that has general information but doesn't have uh, domain-specific knowledge. And then they build small tools that the large language model can reference. So it can reference some type of a tool that, that deals with the SMILES format. Then it has a tool that can ref reference like where you get the chemicals. So I think that is the future. I think um, uh, right now uh, we can get the large language models to uh, be really good in these niche topics. And uh, because uh, if you think about it, the uh, amount of uh, training that, that is relevant for chemistry in these large language models is really, really small, maybe like 0.1%, because they need to know everything, history, politics, uh, biology. Either we'll have custom models that will know all, only chemistry, or we'll have these large language models with these tools like ChemCrow. And uh, also I have a video about the AI scientists. They're trying to do that uh, for not just chemistry, but also other domains uh, um, like biology. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.